Athletics always has been a very important part of my life. I came to the University of Texas from Reed Ridge, Colorado in order to attend the university and, and play football for the Longhorns. I've played football and baseball ever since this, my second grade in, in elementary school. And it's always been just a, an important part of my life. I was, I guess this year was just the big highlight when I was able to play for a national championship football team. Freddie Steinmark was a hard-hitting, overachieving safety at the University of Texas from 1967 to 1969. His senior season was tragically cut short. This is his story based on a book written by Jim Dent, Freddie Steinmark, Courage Beyond the Game, and through an interview done for the American Cancer Society in 1970 prior to his death. Steinmark's perseverance, courage, and bravery is forever remembered at Texas. Teammates will recall the indelible impression Steinmark made on their lives 40 plus years ago. He was 5'10, he was 150 pounds. He was probably the best all round athlete in Colorado. But that did not mean much at all to anybody at big schools. I mean, Dartmouth wanted him. Some little schools wanted him. Colorado, 30 miles away, didn't want him. And a guy named Red Coach, who was the coach at uh, Wheat Ridge High School, called his old friend Mike Campbell. I got two players you want to see. One is Bobby Mitchell. You're going to want him. The other is Freddie Steinmark. We're going to have to see. So. They came up, it was, it was Mike Campbell and Fred Akers came up to see Freddie. The thing about him is he was a little pepper pot. I mean, he was always clapping, he was always patting them on the butt, and uh, he was just, you know, he's an action guy. Who's this, you know, Freddie Steinmark, you know, we think he's, you know, we think he's pretty good, and which was remarkable because even the University of Colorado wasn't interested, nobody was interested. I think he had one other offer. Daryl Roy looked at Freddie and he said, look, when I played at Oklahoma, I was 5'10 and 150 pounds. And Freddie said, coach, a lot of people say I'm too small. And Daryl said, Freddie, they said I was too small. I was an All-American, I won a national championship, I, like, I led the nation in interceptions. You can play at Texas. Anti-war protesters gathered in Chicago for the Democratic Convention that summer. A junior and Freddie's a sophomore comes up from the freshman team and and coach Royals kind of a mantra he had was is you're gonna lose one football game for every sophomore you start he didn't like to do it and here was Freddie Steinmark the smallest guy that you could imagine they immediately made him the starting safety. It was like Tom and I, we weren't very good. We were just better than everybody else that was playing our position at the time. But, but uh, Freddie was, you know, he, was, he wasn't like that. He was good and he knew he was good. It never crossed his mind that he was uh, not going to be a starter for us. And soon, uh, he was a, a heck of a competitor now. Freddie was just a quiet leader and just super, super nice and uh, and just the kind of guy you'd just want to do good for if you played beside him and because he, he was going to do his job correctly and you felt like if you didn't do yours right you'd let him down. You know for him to start his sophomore year um, from an out-of-stater no less and with his size uh, um, you know uh, it, it, that was just a, a, a remarkable call by the coaches and Darrell Rawl to, uh, to see that kind of potential in Freddie. He, he was just relentless at, at what he wanted to do, and, and I think it showed in how he ended up going from the fourth guy on the depth chart to starting. The scoreboard tells the story. Final, 
University of Texas, 36. The University of Tennessee, 13. Steinmark started all 11 games in 1968, and as the Horns walked away from the Cotton Bowl, Steinmark had no idea what was in store for him in 1969. It would be euphoric and tragic, but Freddie was up for the fight of his life. I roomed with Freddie on game nights, uh, night before the games, and uh, they put us in a hotel. And I know that Freddie, from about uh, the, really the start of the season on, was putting hot packs on his thigh. I thought he had a thigh bruise, and he was putting thigh packs on his night the night before the ball games. And uh, then he would get it wrapped on game day, so we knew he had some problem. But uh, I never noticed him limping. I never noticed him missing a step. He was having problems going into the Oklahoma game. Saturday, October the 11th, 1969, the Cotton Bowl in Dallas, Texas. Today marks the first time this season that two unbeaten teams, both ranked in the top ten, will meet as the Sooners of Oklahoma, led by Heisman Trophy candidate Steve Owens, face Darrell Royal's dazzling triple option offense, which has made Texas the second-ranked team in the nation. Texas beat Oklahoma to stay unbeaten. Steinmark was making plays, but the pain in his left leg was worsening. Freddie thought it was a knee injury. No one, not even the Texas training staff, thought it could be anything more. A showdown with unbeaten rival Arkansas was imminent. Steinmark wasn't about to miss that game, pain or not. He thought that he could run extra. He could do extra wind sprints. He'd stay out there after everybody else went in. And he would run, he would, uh, he would try to build his muscles. He thought it was something wrong with, you know, just his preparation. Uh, he had no idea that he was sick. 1969, college football centennial year, the last day of the season, Texas versus Arkansas. Both teams undefeated, untied, rated number one and number two nationally. In the third quarter, Arkansas strikes again as Bill Montgomery fires to All-American receiver Chuck Dykus to make it 14 to nothing. Oh, he got beat bad on a play. He couldn't even make a turn, and and it's clearly there in the in the game films, and uh, and that's when my dad said we've got to pull him out, but I, this, is how, this is how strange it was to me. I didn't know there was anything wrong with him. Because of the, uh, you know, just the dynamic of the game, the fact that we were behind, which <laughs> going into the fourth quarter. Almost crucial fourth down play again for the Longhorns at their own 43 and a half. And going for both for Randy Peschel, and Peschel catches the ball. Texas would rally to win what was considered the game of the century. Freddie celebrated with his team, but the euphoria quickly turned to tragedy for Steinmark. I've been bothered, had been bothered by a, a pain in my, my leg, and uh, it never seemed to bother me that much that I couldn't play. And then at the end of the, after our last regular season game, we decided to uh, have my leg uh, x-rayed. They believed it might be a a calcium deposit and they want to see how large it was. He went to see Daryl. Daryl sent him to the doctor. The next day the doctor sent him to MD Anderson. I had suspicions that it might uh, be something bad like a, a malignant tumor. Uh, and even though I did have these suspicions, it came as a great shock to me. Nobody knew that Freddie had gone to MD Anderson, had the biopsy, found out that half an inch of bone was gone, from his leg, had taken off his leg on that Friday morning, December the 12th, and then MD Anderson released the statement about noon. It hits the radios. 
man, it was terrible. It was news to me. I heard on the radio. I didn't know that Freddie had gone to Houston to the doctor. I don't know that everybody did. I mean, you know, everybody's got their own lives. I'm, I, I go my way, and, and he'd, he'd go his. I remember going to see Freddie, uh, Bill Zappenlack, and I went down uh, to the hospital, and I, you really don't know what to say. And his smile and his eyes lit up, so he, he kind of made you at ease and know that things are going to be all right. And I'll never forget this. I went in to, uh, to check on him, and he wasn't in his room. And I asked the nurse, I said, you know, is, are, is he being x-rayed or is he getting radiation treatment or what? And, because uh, he's not in his room. And I thought, good gracious, you know how sometimes you think the worst. Uh, and I uh, hated what I was thinking. But the nurse said, well, here, come here, I'll show you where he is. We went over and we looked down into the parking lot and he was down there practicing getting in and out of his car uh, with, yeah, that, with crutches and, you know, and it, well, that's the way he was, you know. Do you think that uh, the competitive game with football and the hard knocks you've taken uh, prepared you for this uh, ordeal that you went through? Uh, I think it sure did. Uh, I was scared, but uh, before my operation, but uh, I kind of prepared myself for it. And when you play football, it's just like this season. I had a, a tumor in my leg, yet I, I really didn't know what you learned to play with little uh, bumps and bruises and pain. And, and uh, it's just something that uh, you learn when you play football, you have to play with a little bit of pain, and uh, I guess it, it helped me a whole lot while I was in Houston. I was fortunate enough, though, to have uh, the fine doctors at MD Anderson who were able to diagnose my problem. Uh, with the help of the doctors and and the staff at MD Anderson and uh, all my friends and uh, especially my family and my, and my teammates, I was able to have a, a quick recovery and I was operated on the 13th of December and I was out of the hospital by uh, Christmas Eve. And, able to attend the Cotton Bowl on this, uh, uh, New Year's Day. At the stadium, you can buy a program, but not a ticket. 73,000 spectators jam into the Cotton Bowl under a warm, bright sun. The Cotton Bowl Classic's ninth straight capacity crowd. Lured to Dallas, to see number one take on the opponent Darrell Royal has called the glamour team of college football. The fighting Irish of Notre Dame, the legends of Rockney, and the four horsemen, and win one for the Gipper. Notre Dame hadn't played in a bowl game in 50 years. And so, you know, the Notre Dame fans were really out in force, and, and, they, and we were out in force, and the game went back and forth, and we, of course, we won on the big play. Cliffhanging time. With Freddie watching from the sideline, Texas won the 1970 Cotton Bowl, beating Notre Dame. Fred Akers remembers no question who would receive the game ball in an emotional Texas locker room. Texas leads 21 to 17. If we won that ball game, uh, that, that game ball is going to him. And that was a, that was a foregone conclusion. I don't know if I tell you how proud I am of you. It'd be kind of, you know, an understatement. Uh, I'm afraid if I talk too damn long, I'm going to choke up. But 
We've got a guy that we love a lot. Freddie, here it is for you. So Freddie Steinmark shares in the dream he helped to come true. Across the nation, and here in this loud locker room, Texas is number one. I'll never forget that. Yeah, yeah, Coach Roll. Well, Coach Roll. Well, uh, it still makes me tear up. I mean, it, it just, when I think that that, when we were in high school, that, it, like all good Catholic boys, you know, that's, and he was a devout Catholic. His ultimate dream in life was to go to Notre Dame. I mean, it was just, and when he was so dejected when he was not getting any um, interest from Notre Dame, uh, and the irony of it to be able, you know, a just a few weeks after he had his leg amputated, here we are in the Cotton Bowl playing Notre Dame. Uh, you know, it, I, that was so emotional, and I think I, I think I teared up and cried more than he did. You know, but I, I just uh, um, that was very very powerful scene. I think I think it's one of the classic pictures in the history of sports. Here is a here's a man with one leg in a brown jacket on crutches. National television, Notre Dame, where he wanted to play, with the team that he had led to this national championship possibility, and he can't play. I think it's I think it's one of the most poignant pictures in the history of sports. But what I'll never forget is is going walking down that cotton ball cotton bowl field and seeing him on crutches. Yeah, I knew we weren't going to lose that game. I lost my leg to cancer, but I don't feel that it is a defeat in any way. Uh, I feel fortunate to be here because I think uh, because of the past research that has been done on cancer, I, I think that it helped, it helped me uh, just to be here today. I feel there are a lot of people that are cured, but not enough. Why it happened to somebody like him, you just you start asking yourself why. But I mean, he handled it so well, it was unbelievable. I mean, and the, and the courage it took for him to show up on the sideline at the Cotton Bowl and then uh, walk across the stage to get his letter. Now, I'm telling you, you talk, I, I wish they had a film of it somewhere because they wouldn't have dry in the place there on that thing. Because it's, uh, you know, that's less than six weeks after he had his leg amputated. I was able to walk. Uh on my processes within the week and, uh, and able to attend the banquet in Austin on January 12th, a month after my operation. And uh, I was able to walk across the stage uh, with my artificial limb. You just, you know, you'd think, gosh, these bums over here that are ruining their life, I can it could be one of them. It, it, it just got, got, you just don't expect anything like that to happen. You know, we're, all of us young guys are optimistic. Invincible. And that, uh -huh, bulletproof. It, you can't believe it happened. I mean, even with all the stuff that had gone on with his operation and he lost his leg, you thought he'd get well. Just, surely it's not, you know, and it just, it never happened. An osteosarcoma, we, we barely knew anything about it at that time. Of course, now we know that it's uh, the odds are not very good. And but so through that, the the the, the rest of the time, we everybody was pretty positive about he was going to be fine. You know, until the last few months. I plan to continue my undergraduate education, and, and I hope to go on to law school after I complete and get my degree. And uh, in the meantime, I 
hope to start uh, next fall coaching with the freshmen here at the University of Texas. My outlook is uh, one of hope that with more extensive research on cancer that the ultimate uh, cure will be found where people won't have to die or lose an arm or a leg. It's been 40 years. And one of the keys to this is the fact that his two pictures are on the tunnel walls and the players still do the hook em horn sign. They do. Freddie's memory is alive right here in Austin, Texas and in a lot of places. Mac Brown said to me that fans from all generations are going to gain joy from this story because we loved Freddie. Freddie knew how to live. He did the road mat for life. He was the most courageous, toughest guy who ever played. He will always be remembered at UT. And to me, I mean, personally, I wrote the story. That's very big.